Good afternoon. Uh, this is Joel Saldana with the National Head Start Association. Thanks for joining our Winter in the Head Start Garden webinar um, as part of our Grow More Good webinars. Um, uh, we have quite a number of folks that have uh, signed up. Uh, we have 161 folks from all across the country that are joining in to hear about uh, winter tips, um, about growing a garden. And so thanks for joining. We will be on for about the next hour or so um, with some good content um, on how to uh, grow your garden during the winter. Um, and um, if you have any questions throughout the uh, webinar, uh, you can ask that um, in the right hand side there. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to ask a question. Um, if you ask your question in there, we will get to you. Um, I will be monitoring that. So um, if I find a question that looks relevant to the content at the time we're going through it, I may uh, let the speaker know, the panelists know. If not, I will uh, try and get to them at the very end, which we will have some time at the very end for uh, questions and answers. Um, so again, welcome to the uh, Winter in the Head Start uh, Garden webinar. Um, I'm just going to scroll here, make sure that um, this is uh, working correctly. Um, looks like we're progressing here. So this is more of the welcome. Uh, that gives you a little bit of information about our Grow More Good initiative, um, which is between the National Head Start Association, um, the National Farm to School Network, and the Scott's Miracle Girl Foundation, as well as Kids Gardening. Um, and it's all designed to help inspire um, and support the development of gardening um, uh, in early care programs, and in particular for us at Head Start programs. We'll just continue again. The National Head Start Association, we're one of the partners in this project. Um, for those of you that just joined, my name is Joel Saldana. I'm the Director of Governance and Operations here, and I uh, help coordinate this program on behalf of NHSA. Um, our partners, the Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation. Um, this is a partnership that we entered with uh, last year, um, and Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation has been a fantastic partner to work with, and they're very passionate about um, bringing gardens to Head Start programs across the country. And we have kids gardening as well. Uh, these folks are what I like to consider the subject matter experts, are the ones that really know. Um, all the really good content for programs to grow their garden, um, regardless of, uh, of what their climate situation is like and what climate zone they are across the country. Um, so we will be hearing from some of those folks later on uh, today. Um, and we could progress to our first poll. Again, if you're just joining us, um, Welcome to the Winter in the Head Start Garden webinar. If you have any questions, you can ask that in the software where it says question, ask a question. Um, we will come to it um, as we can. And if not, we will hold it to the very end, which we have some time for question and answer. So I'm going to launch the first poll for you all. Um, it's asking you who is on the webinar today. So that should be coming across your screen right now. And if you will go ahead and select one of the uh, buttons, which is who is on the webinar today, select who you are, early childhood educator and staff, a program manager or director, a curriculum specialist or engagement, a parent or other. Just give a little bit there for folks to go ahead and vote. Okay, so with uh, about 70% of folks voting, we have about 50% that are working in early childhood um, as early childhood educators and staff. 24% are program managers or directors, um, and 20% is other. Um, we have uh, no uh, votes in curriculum specialists or engagement or parents. Uh, going to launch a second poll, which is, do you have a garden in your program? Um, and you have various different ways you can answer that. Yes, we've been gardening for a while. Yes, we just got started. Not yet, but we're planning um, a no, but we are considering one. And you can go ahead and vote on that one.
and just with about over 60% uh, voting, uh, nearly 70%, 40% uh, of folks online today are considering one. Um, that's the biggest group. Uh, and then you have about 24% that have been gardening um, for a while. So yes, they have a garden. 14% um, has say, yes, we just got started. And 28% say, not yet, but we are planning one. So the majority of folks um, are either started a garden or um, are planning one. Uh, great, so this will be an excellent uh, resource for you all to plan during this time of the year. I'm going to progress and um, I'm going to invite our first panelist, uh, Sarah Pounders, who is our education specialist from Kids Gardening, to share about winter garden ideas and tips. And Sarah, are you on? Yes, I am. Um, awesome. And up. welcome. Thank you very much for that introduction. My name is Sarah Pounders. I'm an education specialist. As Joelle has said, Kids Gardening, we are a national nonprofit with the mission of inspiring and providing resources to get more people gardening with youth of all ages in all different settings. Um, and we're very excited to be able to share some of our tips with the Head Start audience today. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about talking about winter garden ideas and tips because I think this is the season where most people decide that they want to take a break from gardening. And I hope that um, what we can share with you today and these ideas we have with you will convince you that this is a great time to continue on to, there's some really cool seasonal aspects of plants to, and, and just nature in general to get your kids excited about, because this is, it really completes the cycle so that the kids can see all different stages of growth with the plants. So next slide. So today, what I'm going to kind of share with you are some ideas about outdoor activities to start out with. And I know that some of you are, are very deep in snow and cold weather, and so you're probably not thinking about outdoor activities. So I'm also going to share some indoor activity ideas for those at work. Um, and then I'm also going to start into talking about planning for spring, which um, this is a great time to begin planning because it it does with good planning, it will really help your garden get kicked off to a good start early in the spring and also growing strong. Um, talk a little bit about seed starting and I'm also gonna point you in the direction of some resources that we have on our website and some other resources um, to kind of get help help you along um, because I definitely think that this time of the year is I, I, it's definitely the the least um, the least garden time so and I'd like to see it become more active so next slide so first of all um, in the outdoor garden it um, the outdoor garden is still out there even though we are not as much um, if you're in a mild climate um, you may still actually have some plants that you can grow outdoors uh, there, there's some plants that really, um, just your common garden plants that actually are a little bit hardier than you might think that they are. And in colder climates, there's a lot of fun activities you can do with perennials, such as wordy shrubs and trees, um, and so that you can kind of continue the learning and, and exploration outside. So I'm gonna kind of share some of those. So next slide. So first, if you're in one of those mild climates, you can still be growing, in most cases, things like greens, like lettuces, spinach, kale, Swiss chard, um, some coal crops like broccoli and cabbage, some root crops like beets, carrots, radishes, and turnips. And my absolute all-time favorite is pansies. Um, they, are, they, are, they even can grow under snow um, if they get kind of protected. Just depends on the weather and the climate. So those are some really fun stuff that you can keep growing. And a lot of times, if you're in those mild climates, you're gonna pair them with this next slide. Um, some season extender ideas. So all of these kind of help tide you over when you do have those real cold snaps. Um, so you may have to provide some extra um, protection if you're even when you're in a mild climate. So things um, such as just sheets and blankets. I, I'm in Texas, so I fall right in those mild climates. So a lot of times we have, we'll have a couple day stretch where it's really cold and we can protect everything just with sheets and blankets and, and pretty easily that way. If you're a little bit further north, you might want to look into this picture right here is of a, a homemade cold frame. And basically it is um, kind of an insulated box and you cover it with glass or plastic of some sort, which allows the sun's rays to come in during the day and trap the heat and keep that area 
um, nice and toasty for your plants. There's also hoop houses, which are similar, um, but a little different in design, row covers. And then of course, uh, greenhouses are also great too. Um, those are definitely a little bit step up compared to, to some of those. But if you're in one of those climates where you don't get out much during the school year, it might be something you wanna look into. So next slide. So what about for those of you who are in real cold climates and you probably think I'm crazy right now talking <laughs> about putting things in the ground at this time of year. So there's still some really cool things going out on your garden. First of all, it is a lot of fun to do. Um, all of your deciduous trees have a whole new look to them at this time of year. Um, you can really see their skeleton and their structure and that can be a lot of fun they, because you can really tell the different shapes. You can see some that are pyramidal, some are that are oval, some that are really pretty round um, and some naturally round and some just because people have cut them that way um, in pruning. So you can do some tr um, shape studies, also bark rubbings, all of the different bark, it's um, now that the leaves are off it, so you really can get a chance to really look at it and see all the different textures and uh, that are available and just put a piece of paper over that bark and start rubbing on it with the side of a crayon and you'll be amazed at all the different artwork you can do. This is a great time to look at winter birds. For all of those non-migratory birds that are still up north, you can do things like put out bird seed um, to help attract them, or either just plant um, plants that have berries and are naturally attracted to them. A lot of conifers can serve as homes for them during this time of year. So it's a great time to, to, to watch wildlife in, um, because there's not as much going on with all of the colors, and so they really, they make, they're more vibrant at this time of year. Another thing to keep in mind, and we have a link to this um, later on in the thing, is, is that a lot of, some of these spring blooming trees and shrubs that bloom really early in the, in the spring, so um, they actually form their flower buds in the fall, and then they just stay dormant over the winter, and then they pop up as soon as the warm weather hits. And so some of these things that um, are examples are forsythia, redbud, maples, pussy willow. So actually the flower buds are already there. So you can take advantage of that, but you can take a cutting and actually bring it inside give it some warm temperatures and water. And the, like I said, the instructions are on our website and actually they will start blooming for it for you inside. So it's actually kind of like creating your own little spring in your classroom. So that in the, even if you don't bring them in, it's very interesting to go out and look on the trees and shrubs and see the little flower buds getting ready to come out and then they can kind of track them. Um, another fun activity is art using found object, objects. So thinking beyond snowman, so it, it doesn't just have to be snowman, but there's lots of different things that are still out there that are left over in your garden or just in a natural area. And you can create artwork um, on those days that are warm enough for you to go outside, create your own little art show to show off um, all from natural objects. Or if it's super cold to, to gather those things and then bring them inside. So next slide. So if, you, if it really is just too cold or you would just like something more consistent, indoor gardening is also so much fun at this time of year. And there's lots of different ways that you can do this depending on your budget and the space you have available. Um, so we're gonna talk about three different ways here um, that are kind of common. And one is just to use a windowsill. One is to use grow lights. So you're providing extra light. And the next is to use hydroponics. So next slide. So first is the windsow cell. So obviously this is the least expensive and, and potentially most um, available. Per, uh, I know a lot of classrooms don't have windows and so this may or may not be an option for your classroom. But hopefully there's some window somewhere um, in your building or your center that you can use. The best, if for the best success, if you're just going to grow some things in your windowsill, you want to look for windows that are facing the south or west because they are going to have the greatest light available ability for you, which also will um, impact your temperatures. So usually if you are growing in these windowsills, you are going to have slightly cooler temperatures than what's in the rest of the room. Um, just even with the best of insulated windows, they're just going to be a little bit cooler. So you have to keep that in mind. So if you're using your windowsill, you also want to try your best to um, pick out plants 
that are going to be happy in low light. So those low light plants are usually greens. So like lettuces, um, there's a couple herbs that will do well for you and also house plants. So a lot of tropical house plants are uh, rainforest plants and they're actually used to being on the lower levels of the rainforest. And so they're used to lower light. Um, so those are the kind of the things that you want to look at and be successful with, to be successful with. Um, and another very, very important thing when you're working with a windowsill is to make sure to protect your windowsill from any water spills. Either make sure your um, your pots have uh, their own individual saucer or either put them in a plate, something. That, that is one thing that I've seen many times is to, to have windowsills that uh, get a little too wet. So make sure to, that you do you add that in. So the next option is if you can have a little bit of money to spend. So next slide is to do grow lights. So grow lights are gonna add a lot to your success. And there's actually some that come prefabricated and you can also just make your own just from even shop lights that you get um, from a hardware store. Um, and they sell special grow, la grow lights that are for plant growth um, just in any hardware store too. Or you can even just use fluorescent um, or um, LED bulbs uh, that are meant for other things. You want to look for the kinds that they they actually will say on their sunlight, warm sunlight um, on, on, the, on the boxes. So this picture right here is one, probably a prefabricated one, but you can see that it's very small. You can make them with wheels so they can move around. Um, you can also, there's lots of different um, sizes, shapes, they can stack, they can be on top of countertops, they can be on the floor. So there's a lot of flexibility. So the nice thing about having the lights is you have a lot more control over your light, your temperature and your humidity. And so you can try and get your plants a little bit more of um, what they really want to grow. It also expands the different types of plants you can grow. Um, and it also expands your location options too. So for instance, if you don't have a window in a classroom, then this would be your best option um, to try. So next slide. The third thing was um, hydroponics. And hydroponics can have lights or not have lights. And basically, it's just another option. I know we had our program spotlight from the fall had mentioned their hydroponic unit that they were using. Um, and it's basically using, instead of using soil, you're using water as the structure for your plants and your plant roots. They also, once again, have um, do-it-yourself models or prefabricated. And your plants receive their nutrition through the water instead of through soil. And it's just a, it's a neat option option because kids it's something kids haven't necessarily seen at home um, or anywhere else and so it's kind of fun and also in hydroponics the plants grow very quickly because you have such uh, you're delivering all those nutrients straight to the soil so next slide so what kind of plants can you grow indoors um, especially if you have lights available, it kind of expands your selection. So once again, greens are a real easy, easy thing to start with just because you can harvest them before they need flowers. You can harvest them at any stage. So the next one down you see is I've written microgreens. So what are microgreens? Microgreens are really just any type of greens that you can eat um, when they're very, very tiny. They don't have to get very large and you can throw them into a salad or on top of a sandwich. Um, so most of those, they can be quick harvest harvest so they grow from like 14 to 28 days and you're already harvesting them um, and it's just some things like lettuce and kale like things that you can also grow to be larger but they also are fine to grow smaller and so the nice thing about that is is that it's not a long-term investment you don't have to worry as much with fertilizing them and in the light because they're just growing very quickly some other plants you can grow are beans there are some herbs that can grow that really well root crops do well um, and obviously indoors, non-edible house plants also will grow well under um, grow lights. Two things that I always have for the kids to look at are African violets and um, strawberry geraniums because they're just really easy to grow um, inside and, and they just reproduce and make more um, very quickly. So the main thing to think about is I uh, to look for plants that are gonna be short, that have a short growing um, uh, length and also I in the in the handout section for you guys around the right, you'll see that there is a uh, PDF file that's called Grow Lab Complete Guide Appendix, and in that 
um, we have put together, and it's part of our Grow Lab guide, a list of plants that grow well inside and included the variety names of some varieties that grow well, particularly grow well in the lower light and in indoor grow lights and potentially also in windowsills too. So if you're looking for some ideas and speci some specific variety names, then you'll want to download that and you can see that list. It includes vegetables, herbs, and flowers. So next slide. So really indoor gardening, these are the main things you're going to need is you're going to need pots and it doesn't have to be purchased pots. You can also repurpose materials such as milk cartons or yogurt containers, egg cartons. No matter what you use, the only hitch is it needs to have some holes for drainage because too much water is going to be just as bad as not enough water for your plants. And um, young children love to water. So you definitely need to have those drainage holes. Um, so and you also need a tray to catch that, that runoff to make sure that you don't end up with water in places that you don't want to. So if you need pots, you need to have well-draining soilless potting mix. So you can't just use soil from outside. You do want the soilless potting mix, which is made up. Um, it's like lighter weight material. Um, usually it's things uh, that like um, peat moss and vermiculite. So it just has a, it, it, the plants indoors do a lot better with it because it's easier to drain. Um, you need something to water with. You don't have to go out and buy expensive watering cans. You can just use wa um, re repurposed water bottles, um, something to catch the water. And that's really all you have to have to get started with indoor gardening. Now, there are certainly lots of optional things that you can add if you have the time and interest. For instance, there's um, moisture grids that you can sit things on so the, it doesn't sit in water. There's heating mats if you're in a very cold um, classroom, and I think I have a picture of one later on. You can also have a timer for your lights if you have lights. You can also create a humidity tent to help keep the, the moisture in your room. So we'll look at those in a second. So next slide. So you also don't have to have a full garden growing. You can just do some garden activities to try and keep kids interested in gardening until you get to your spring garden outside. So first of all, seed starting. Um, obviously always popular. Microgreens, I've already mentioned. So root cuttings, and when I say root cuttings, that means to actually, if you have a parent plant, you can take off leaves and stems of some of them. And once again, I'll have some links for you down on our website and put them into soil and you can make new plants just from the cuttings. So um, this can be a fun for the kids and it also they can have something that they can take home with them. Terrariums are also one of my favorites. There's a little picture there of one that's made from two liter bottles, just a layer of rock a layer of this uh, potting soil mix, and then some small indoor plants. And you water that soil in really well and cover it, and then you never have to water it again. So this is, a terrarium could be any size, shape, um, and that's a good activity if you are worried about kids getting into your plants regularly, or you wanna make sure that they're not being able to eat them. It kind of keeps them protected, and yet at the same time, they can watch and watch the water cycle through. Another one of the favorite activities off our website is called kitchen scrap gardening. And basically that is just using things um, as you're cooking that you have left over to create gardening projects. So uh, you can see in this picture right here, you see an avocado seed that is sprouting in a, in a little container of water. Potatoes and sweet potatoes, you can also get some of those same results as long as they haven't been treated with anything. If you have the tops of carrots, you can actually cut the top of a carrot off and cut all the greens off, place it in a small tray of water, and those greens will start to grow back again. Um, so you want the carrots from the grocery store that have the greens still left on them when you take them home. You take off the, the, top, and the top greens and you cut it so that you have about maybe two or three inches left of the carrot, um, stick it in a tray of water and those, those greens will sprout back up again. And the kids actually think that's just amazing. Um, so kitchen scrap gardening, and I'll give you links to some more ideas for that. Hydroponics I mentioned. And a third thing that we hadn't mentioned yet is vermicomposting. So vermicomposting is using uh, worms and it, you're using red worms, not the kind that you dig up out of the soils, that, but there are worms that are native to areas where it is more like our indoor climate, so they don't like to be outside. Um, that you can create, and I'm, this is going to be a very short description of vermicomposting, but basically you can create these worm bins where you can put your food scraps in. The worms eat on it and then they create this wonderful fertilizer with their, their worm poop. Um, and it's great for your plants. You can 
um, fertilize with it both in your indoor and your outdoor gardening late, late, later. And the kids love watching the worms um, taking care and recycling their their uh, food scraps. So more information on that. Um, and that's another cool thing to do in the wintertime. So more information coming. So next slide. So you can also take this time to plan for spring. So um, you can do this by um, making sure to add in lots of of um, books, children's literature to, to to read, and on our website we have a lot of different suggestions. You may also want to take time to research some different crops and then have the kids vote on their favorites and start um, deciding what they want to plant, draw up your own garden um, plan, um, and it's also a good time to create your garden schedule. So next slide. So when you're doing seed starting, so if you're looking at your schedule and when you're going to be able to plant outdoors, so there's some things that you need to think about. So if you're seed starting for eventually transplanting outdoors, you're going to start by looking what your average frost-free date is in your location. And that's something you can usually get pretty quickly online or through your extension office and find out when you're going to be able to plant outside. And then you need to work backwards from there because you don't want your plants to stay growing too long inside if you're eventually gonna transfer them outside. Uh, each plant is different, but in general, um, you know, six to eight weeks is generally the amount of time you would have the seeds start to grow outside to then transplant outside. And then of course, you also can just grow things um, that you're planning to indefinitely stay inside. So next slide. So the things that you'll need to consider about if you are growing plants uh, from seed is you is light. Light will be important for you because most plants don't need the light when they're first germinating, but really good light as they start growing will be important to make sure that you have good stocky plants later on. Because if you're if there's the it's too low of light for those plants, what'll happen is that they'll get really it's called being leggy. So the the cells will grow really big and very quickly, and so they'll be very um, kind of bendy and they won't have the real strong stems. So what you'll do is as you you want to get them closer and closer to the light. Um, so grow lights are really great if you're planning on eventually um, transplanting your seeds outside. You can also do it in. Um, uh, in a windowsill if you want to, but I would definitely wait and, cl and start those closer to the time when you're going to be able to take them outside. If you're using the artificial light, you're going to leave it on like 14 to 16 hours a day potentially, and so automatic timers work out really well. So light will be important if you're starting your seeds to prepare for your spring garden. Next slide. So temperature, temperature will be also something you'll need to pay attention to. So most seeds prefer temperatures between 65 and 70, just like all of us, I'm sure. Um, and so it's it really can slow down their process if it's cooler in your classroom, especially if I know that some um, classrooms may have the turn down the temperature at night and on the weekends. We ran into this problem at our school last year where that I couldn't figure out why our bean seeds were growing, and it was because they were turning off the heat every night and on the weekend, and so they were they were getting delayed on that. You can buy special heating mats, and you can see one um, here in this picture that is for plant specifically for growing plants so that make sure it's safe with all the water and the soil and the plant roots. Um, and so that is something that you can can place your plant on if you're having a real a lot of struggles with um, temperature. Next slide. And the last thing that you'll need to keep on mind is water. So whenever you're planting seeds inside, make sure that you always moisten your soil before you plant. Because if you try, it's really hard to get the soil just the right, the moisture level if you, after you put your seeds in. So you actually want to take the time to put all your soil in a big bowl or container, mix it so that it feels really moist, sort of like a wet sponge. So if you pick up a, a scoop of your, your soil and you squeeze it, you don't want water to run out, but you want it to feel like a nice warm sponge. Um, so you want to make sure to, to keep it moist. That'll be because indoors, they tend to dry out a lot more than outdoors because we have these the heat pumping and it can be a real problem. Spray bottles are really useful indoors and especially with young children because a, that way the, the young seedlings don't get washed away <laughs> as the water goes on out of them. Also, too much water can lead to just as many problems as not enough as I, as I mentioned before. Next slide. 
So nutrients. So many of the potting mixes, if you buy your own potting mix, they probably are, they might already have nutrients included. And so you won't even need to think about it. In fact, most of them usually do if you buy them from, from a hardware store or from a, a garden store. Um, you can also, like we mentioned, vermicomposting either if you earlier, if you want to do your own worm compost to add to it. And also keep in mind that your seeds actually have some initial nutrients in them. So you won't need nutrients right at the start, but later on as they continue to grow. And you'll kind of just need to keep an eye on them if you start seeing them get kind of yellow that might be something you need to look into next slide so what we've done here and you can download the pdf file to get the links to all of these they should be all linkable is um, these are some of the links to our website for articles for more information about the different things that i've talked to uh, the activities that i've talked to about a day that have specific instructions and materials needed and estimated time to complete next slide and I also just want to point out the, the Grow Lab. This is a book that um, we have a Grow Lab activities guide that has um, lesson plans for ages K through eight. And some of those might work with younger kids too. But this specific book that we have is just really all about indoor gardening and indoor seed starting. And also online, we do have two articles on indoor gardening and indoor seed starting too. So just more information about what I've talked about today, because I've just kind of given you a broad overview. So if it's, you're really new to this and you're new to indoor gardening, you might want to check one of those indoor indoor gardening um, articles out. It kind of gives you step-by-step -step instructions. So, um, or this complete guide also. Next slide. Oh, and it's, I'm gonna be gonna turn it over to Emily next. <laughs> Hello, I'm Emily Sparling. I am a program specialist over at the Minnesota History Center. Um, but in a previous life, I put together this curriculum in conjunction with Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation and the Smithsonian Early Enrichment Center in Washington, DC. So next slide. Um, I am so happy that we have Sarah and all the resources that she brings um, to really talk about the nuts and bolts of gardening, um, especially with little people. And my role and the curriculum that we have is really about how to integrate what happens in the garden to what you have in your classroom already. So uh, extending your work beyond the walls of your classroom into the garden space, um, really seeing this as a part of what you do, not necessarily as an additional thing that you're adding on. Um, so really looking at all the different kinds of um, things that you explore in the classroom and, and ways to, to reflect that in the garden. So some of the guiding principles that we used when putting this curriculum together was, um, and these will be familiar to anyone who's an educator, that learning, though not always visible, is always happening. These lessons are designed um, using inquiry. We are not necessarily looking to get kids towards a specific answer, but we're, at, we're, we're helping cultivate the practice of asking good questions. Uh, the mantra of every preschool teacher, things might not go as planned. Um, these lessons are designed to be used in whatever way works best for you. You can use all the lessons or just pull a piece out of it. Planting and cultivating a garden is believing in possibility. The lessons are designed to generate excitement about the future. Next slide, please. Um, and then again, thinking about how we Re, how we explore these concepts over and over and over again through repetition. So each lesson includes a way to take the learning out into the community um, so that kids can start making connections between the library and the garden and their classroom space and the car trip from, um, you know, the, their, their home to the, the grocery store. Uh, when a young child's innate curiosity is unleashed in a garden, the possibilities are endless. Um, there's so many things they can explore, pretend, experiment with. Um, and of course, you will get dirty and there will be bugs. Um, next slide, please. So um, as we've been talking, and I apologize for those of you if you were on the last webinar, some of this it will be repetitive, um, just talking about the architecture of the lessons. But um, are, these are some of the guiding questions that we were thinking about. And it's just a good practice when you're thinking about how you plan to use your garden with your classroom or your family to be thinking about kind of what are some of the ways that, that you plan to um, integrate skills, content, um, community, um, and then sort of how you're gonna continue that learning beyond what you do in the garden. Next slide, please. So these lessons are designed around sort of six major themes and 
three different sort of age brackets. So we had um, the tiny gardeners that were our infants and toddlers, um, uh, growing gardeners, which was um, pre-K through first grade, uh, pre-K through kindergarten, and then we had our garden guides, which are first through third graders. Um, but of course, you're welcome to adapt any of the lessons um, for whatever age group you're working with. Uh, and then we had these big topics, air, critters, plants, soil, sun, and water. And then, of course, um, lumped into the four um, categories around seasons. So um, each one has is, is searchable by age, theme, and season. Next slide, please. And so I'm going to walk you through just a couple of um, lessons that I pulled. I pulled two lessons. They're both fall under the plant category. And as Sarah was saying, you know, I, the, the garden in the winter seems like kind of a quiet and perhaps cold place. I'm, I'm up in Minnesota, so I'm sort of the polar opposite of what Sarah's experiencing. I'm looking out my window at a lot of snow um, and wondering, okay, what is growing under there? But I too can see buds on some of the trees and um, there's a lot of wildlife activity happening around, especially around my feeders. So, um, one thing that those of us, particularly in the more northern climates, experience is sort of some sensory deprivation, and I think kids are sensitive to that as well. And so um, I know that it's always revelatory when I begin to hear birds again, and I can smell things beyond just cold <laughs> winterness. Um, so one way we can bring that into the classroom is by looking at seeds. Um, and so with each lesson, we always start with um, either a piece of art or um, a, images of a particular place that you can explore with your students um, and a piece of literature that you can read. And so um, I love Leo Leone uh, and all of their um, beautiful artwork. And then this is um, a facade um, in Morocco um, and a mosaic tile. So uh, next slide, please. So you can start a lesson by kind of bringing some of these materials with you either in your classroom or bringing them um, to the to the garden. Um, so each each lesson begins with materials to bring, sort of the main um, objects and or images that you're going to explore, and then a book that you'll read. Um, and so again, this could be done in the classroom space, or you could export it outside, depending on what the temperature is. I know today my son did not go outside because it was negative two, but um, they, uh, whenever possible, have them outside. So um, the garden can feel kind of empty, but I, I think we can, especially with little ones, bring some energy and noise to this space. And seeds are great because there's a texture element. They can feel them. They can smell them. They can shake them. They can make all kinds of different noises. And so those are some of the things that we encourage you to do with them, either in your classroom or in the garden. So what colors can you find? What noises do you hear? And of course, for those of you not in a northern climate, there's probably a lot more noise and sound in your garden at this time of year. Um, I know some of our loons have migrated down to, to Florida, to, so you can listen for them. Can you make some sounds? Can you stomp on the ice, squeak your boots, um, or rustle leaves, break twigs, anything like that, just to bring some life into your space. Uh, next slide, please. And then um, as we started the, the, the lesson with sort of the um, images of the mosaics on the mosque, you can bring that in and explore that through making seed art. Um, of course, up here in Minnesota, we have um, crop art at the state fair. That's very popular. So you can find those sorts of images. But I, I love bringing in the mosaic idea and they can assemble different, um, uh, different seeds into whatever kind of design they've incorporated. You can certainly use paint or whatever other art materials you have to bring additional color to that. You can also create shakers. I've done this with ECFE. We have um, an early childhood family education, pretty robust um, group of folks up here that we, we do all kinds of noisemakers and things like that. Um, and then, of course, with seeds, thinking about um, the wildlife and all of the birds that would ex would be attracted to seeds in your garden. That's a way to bring more life in your garden by putting out feeders. There's some really simple ways of doing feeders. I have the pine cone one here. You can also take a log and sort of chisel out little um, notches in that, fill them with peanut butter and some 
um, bird seed or um, however you want to do that in your area. So that's one thing that you can do with young children in the garden and it's kind of a way, um, again, I want to uh, as extend what you're doing in your classroom space. Working with seeds is helping develop the, the pincher grip for young kids, which is really important, as you know, for um, being able to write and sort of things. So you're 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 doing skills that are going to be great used both in the garden and in your classroom. Next slide, please. And so this is the same kind of this is the same season, the same topic area, plants, but adapted for the first through third graders. Um, and again, starting with both an image and a book, um, and this is sort of represent the, this piece of art is sort of representing kind of the the tangled mess that might be underground, um, even though above ground it might seem just sort of uniform and orderly. But there's still lots happening in our garden spaces. Um, and as Sarah alluded to, this is a great time to start planning for spring. And then, and that's a great executive function skill, helping children start to understand how to plan ahead and thinking through how they want to lay something out, creating the design for a space. Next slide, please. So really taking stock of what your garden space is experiencing. This is another opportunity for the for your students to feel ownership over that space that they're helping to create with you. Um, so what can they work with you to rebuild or fences down, um, reinforcing different things, making sure that your hoses are patched and have what they need. Um, and then just really being creative, like what would they like to see in the garden in the future? What is something that they can create to bring into the space? Um, and what, what are they excited about? So, um, one of the skill areas we were thinking about as we designed this lesson was mapping and um, math and incorporating that into this so bringing in a measuring tape and measuring the the different garden beds and beginning to make um, some scale drawings if, if possible in a notebook excuse me um, next slide please so um, also incorporating the element of like starting to figure out how to research and look ahead, you know, to, to see what would what would work in your space. And again, this is where I defer to Sarah and her, um, the, uh, their organization, all the great um, work that they have there is to help kind of explore what what works seasonally in your growing um, region and um, what what you could start to grow. Um, and then. So there's, and then extending that beyond the garden here, we're just talking about maps. And um, I know kids are often fascinated by, you know, just just the beautiful imagery that's present in maps, but also starting to kind of understand where where people are at in the world and how um, uh, how they find themselves there. So um, it's great to just explore some different maps to even think about if you have a local extension office and getting some top, um, topographical maps of your area, seeing, um, starting to understand like how, um, how all of those work. Um, and then yeah, again, some additional material with um, seedsavers.org. Um, I think it's also really interesting to think about, I know something specific to the work that I do um, say at the History Center, when you think of seasonally, like in our area, um, there are certain stories um, that can only be told when snow is on the ground. So we have, um, so I have someone who's coming to tell some Ojibwe stories and to talk about constellations in the night sky. And some of those stories can only be told when snow is on the ground. And so um, to sort of explore different, um, different regional, um, identities in your area and thinking about kind of what 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 is what are the things that you can explore in a season that sometimes seems a little bit quieter. So next slide, please. I think that yeah, so here is the link to the um, to that full curriculum and you can of course go um, either on the Head Start website, uh, there's a link to that or else um, in the handout. So I think next slide that might be the end for me. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Emily. Those are some really, really great tips. Um, and we're going to kind of go into my portion of the webinar now. My name is Christine Gall, and I'm an education specialist with Kids Gardening. 
Um, beyond my work with kids gardening, I am also the garden education coordinator for the Burlington School District in Burlington, Vermont. And this basically means that I spend about half my week doing gardening, cooking, and or tasting activities with students of all ages. And a lot of about um, a lot of what I'm about to share with you is directly informed by this work. Basically, during this portion of the webinar, I'll be sharing some ideas for tackling nutrition and cooking-based activities in the context of a winter garden, or more broadly, the winter season. Um, in particular, we'll investigate you know, what you can bring to the table that's seasonally relevant, whether that's something you're growing or simply sourcing from a grocery store. Uh, next slide, please. So um, if you tuned into the fall webinar, you'll know I talked a lot about how geography will impact what you might be able to harvest from your garden and use in a cooking or tasting activity um, at any particular time of year. So you know, basically gardens, they're going to look very different at this time of year, depending upon where you are in the country, um, as both Sarah and Emily talked about. So in northern climates, such as Vermont, where I teach, um, there's no way we're going to get any fresh produce from a garden um, from November until probably April. It's a pretty long winter for us. So if we want to do any cooking or tasting activities using produce that students helped grow, you know, fostering that deeper connection between students and a particular food, um, we're generally sticking to microgreens or baby greens grown using an indoor grow light system like the ones that Sarah mentioned. Now, as she also mentioned, you don't need a grow light system to grow microgreens, um, though it definitely helps, especially if you want to produce a decent amount. So, you know, if you don't have grow lights, you can try germinating seeds and growing lettuce on any sunny windowsill. Um, and you could also try some hydroponic systems like tower gardens, or perhaps if you're even lucky, you might have a greenhouse where you're able to grow throughout the winter. Um, beyond microgreens, uh, easy crops to plant under a grow light or just inside, you know, might include assorted herbs. You can also try radishes um, if you have some deeper pots or trays for planting. But really, greens can stretch pretty far in a tasting activity, especially if you plant um, a variety that have different tastes and appearances. So, for example, a uh, regular leaf lettuce versus kale or arugula or mustard greens. All of these have very different flavor profiles and textures, and they can be really, really fun to compare in any tasting activity that you might do with your students. Uh, next slide, please. Now, if you are in a southern climate where you don't, um, you don't need to worry about colder weather, where you're able to maintain a vegetable garden throughout the winter months, um, you don't necessarily need to worry about some of those restrictions that I had just mentioned. Um, the world is really your oyster, and I would definitely recommend taking advantage of all the things that you might be growing um, in your garden, including any produce that is particularly seasonal. Um, for example, if you're fortunate enough to have any citrus trees in a garden um, that are producing during the winter months and only during the winter months, you know, you should definitely feature that. Um, citrus fruits are so great to try with young learners because they have really strong flavors and a tasting exercise can be a perfect opportunity to tackle like vocabulary um, around both taste and even colors. So comparing the green of a lime to the yellow of a lemon to the pink interior of a grapefruit. Um, one thing to be mindful of if you are introducing citrus um, in a tasting activity is seeds. Um, sometimes there can be a bunch in any sort of citrus. I know I ate a clementine the other day that was full of seeds. So you'll definitely wanna take a look at what you're sampling with students before they take a bite to avoid any issues like that. Next slide, please. Now, there may be a bunch of uh, folks on this webinar, attending this webinar, who don't have gardens at their program sites. And if that's the case, then focusing on seasonal produce in general can be a great way of connecting an everyday tasting activity to the current season. 
So as you'll see on this slide, winter is the primary harvest window for a variety of fruits and vegetables. Um, this is at a national level. And so all of these items should be readily available in abundance at your grocery store or through a food service provider if you have one. And depending upon where you're located, you may even be able to buy these items from a local producer. And that opens up the opportunity to talk about, you know, if your area is well known for producing a particular type of food or even to connect with a local farmer. You can also consider some traditional winter storage crops, such as carrots, beets, parsnips, even cabbage. Uh, so while these aren't traditionally grown during the winter, they have a great shelf life if stored properly. And historically, they've served as the, you know, the wintertime fresh produce option for those in colder climates. So you can make some connections there as well. Next slide, please. So now we're going to switch from talking about the type of produce you might use in a cooking or tasting activity to some recipe resources that will hopefully get you inspired or serve as, you know, a concrete takeaway from this portion of the webinar. So many of these resources will be familiar to those who participated in the fall webinar, but I featured a couple new recipes this time around um, that are, you know, winter themed perhaps. So for starters, I wanted to share Sowing the Seeds of Wonder, which is a curriculum that we at Kids Gardening publish with the help of our friends at Life Lab in Santa Cruz. Um, while the whole curriculum contains great lessons for young learners in the garden, of particular interest to our current conversation is a chapter with fantastic selection of harvesting and cooking activities. Um, on the webinar control panel, you can actually access and download a PDF of a stone soup recipe that's particularly relevant at this time of year, whether you're in a northern climate where it might be nice to make a warm soup on a cold day, or in a southern climate where you may be growing, um, you know, many of the recipes in this, um, in, or many of the ingredients in this recipe. And if you're just interested in the curriculum in general, um, the original link that you just saw um, shortly ago will take you to a website where you can purchase it if you want kind of the whole slew of activities and recipes. The second resource I wanted to share is Chop Chop. It's a really wonderful print magazine and online resource. It has a huge index of recipes that range from super quick one to three ingredient options to more time consuming and complex ones. Um, and I've linked two recipes here. The first is for a kale salad. And I've you know, shared this one with kind of some of the programs that might be in colder climates in mind. So where you might be restricted to growing greens indoors. Um, Chop Chop has tons of salad dressing recipes. So if Caesar isn't your thing, you can easily try something else that they have on their website. Um, the second recipe highlights citrus, which as I mentioned earlier, is, a prime, is primarily grown during winter months. Um, and I'm guessing for this recipe, you don't necessarily have to use grapefruit. Um, you could probably amend it and try a different citrus fruit. And that really opens the door to some discussions about flavor comparisons if you tackle both the original recipe and your own version featuring a different citrus option. Finally, we have Cooking Matters, which is another fantastic online resource, not just for recipes, but um, for general cooking and nutrition tips. So for example, they have a little article about how you can savor seasonal fruits and vegetables, um, which I have linked in the PowerPoint. And you might want to take a look at that to think about how you can tie seasonal eating and tasting um, to various activities year round. Uh, I've also included links to a sweet potato fry recipe as well as an orange glazed carrot recipe. Sweet potatoes and carrots are both storage crops that are commonly kept over the winter. So if you are in a northern site, you can make that connection. Um, whereas in a southern area or a southern site, once again, you might actually be growing these things in your garden. The carrot recipe also has the added benefit um, of kind of including orange. So that's another tie to citrus, again, a seasonal food. So those are all the resources that I have for you today. Um, you should be able to access those links through the PowerPoint, which I think you'll have access to as like a handout 
Um, if not, I'm sure we can get those to you in another format. But that's all I have. I think at this point we might be transitioning to some questions. Thank you, Christine. Um, yes, uh, we are open for questions. And actually, I've not had any questions come through other than how to access the uh, PDF of the presentation. And I was sharing that with the individuals that asked for that. You can click onto it. But um, if you have any questions, we're certainly open for that right now in the software where it says uh, ask a question. You can go ahead and submit on there. Um, again, the handouts are on the software as well. So it includes the uh, presentation that you're looking at um, right now that is in PDF form with the live links. So all of the uh, tasting and cooking resources that Christine spoke about are all linked in there and they're live. Um, so that's available to you. Um, and all the other links are also live as well on the PDF. Um, but we are um, open for any questions that may have come up from um, spending the last uh, 55 minutes with us, um, learning how to uh, create your winter garden and keep it resilient um, and planning for spring. Um, open for any questions. Uh, I don't see anything just coming in yet. So I'm going to go ahead and launch one of the polls, or actually the final poll, um, which is, do you plan to uh, garden this winter? And if we'll have folks go ahead and vote on their screens. Between yes, we have already started. Yes, we plan to, but have not started yet. Maybe we're still thinking about it. Or no, we're going to hold on these ideas until the spring. Okay, and just over 50% voting uh, are at 50% um, uh, uh, of the audience, um, which 40% are saying, yes, we plan to, but have not started yet. 12 have already started. That's great. So hopefully these tips uh, uh, will be helpful to you. And looks like there's another 30% um, that are still thinking about it. So hopefully this um, uh, webinar is helpful to you all. Uh, so we'll go ahead and close that. Um, and just sharing the upcoming webinars. So we do have Spring in the Garden, which is going to be March 5th, uh, same time. And there's the registration link for that. And then uh, Summer in the Garden, which is May 7th, um, same time. And the registering, registration link is there for you as well if you'd like to sign up for those right now. And here's some additional support resources through kidsgardening.org. Um, I don't know if Sarah, did you want to mention anything on these specifically or as we progress into the um, last few slides here on the grant availability? Sure, yeah, I'll just add on. So this website has a lot of links to different resources on getting started. So, um, and it's also got links to contacting us for more information. So I just wanted to provide that for you guys. And on the next slide here, I just wanted to mention, <clears throat> we have the, um, thanks to our wonderful sponsors, the Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation, we also have the Grow More Good Grassroots Grant is now open. And that is open to any, um, nonprofit and educational uh, organization that is gardening with at least, at least 15 kids ages three through 18. So most of your organizations are gonna be able to um, be eligible to that. And we wanted to make sure that, that you knew it was available. Um, this year we have 175 grant opportunities with um, 25 receiving excuse me, 25 receiving um, funding of $1,000 and the other 150 receiving funding of $500 for your garden and natural green space programs. So I wanted to provide this link. The deadline is February 14th. Um, please feel free to contact us if you have any questions about the application process um, um, or the, but it's very uh, flexible. It's for helping gardens get started and the gardens of your vision get started. So I hope that some of you might take advantage of this. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and again, if there's any questions that come up, um, you're not really sure where to turn to, here's some uh, email addresses you can write to, uh, gardens at nhsa.org. 
um, we'll receive that here and, and filter through where uh, your question is. Um, you can also reach out to info at kidsgardening.org or Sarah P, who you just heard, Sarah Pounders, at kidsgardening.org. Um, feel free to reach out with any question. Uh, we'll be happy to assist you. And well, I think we've <laughs> progressed onto the questions, but I don't see any questions that um, are here. I wanna offer the opportunity for the panelists to share anything um, anything that we might have missed? Sir, Christine? I, I just want to say thank you to everyone for thank attending you. and for giving us a chance to to talk about gardens in this winter months. Um, I really hope that you'll you'll look at your outdoor space in a different way um, as it open for possibilities, even even when it is cold outside. So um, and please feel free to contact us with me with any questions. Thank you, Sarah. I actually have a question that has come in. Let me just make sure. Uh, we receive a certificate for attending. Uh, Dana, I'll respond to you separately on that. Uh, any other questions that have come in? Emily, Christine, any final comments that you all wanted to share? Are you okay? Uh, if any folks have questions about cooking or doing tasting activities with students related to what I talked about, please feel free to reach out with Sarah and she can forward your message to me. Yes, same here. If you have any questions just about incorporating your curriculum and content from your classrooms into the garden space, I'm happy to, to answer those. And thank you so much for spending some time with us. Great. Thanks, everyone. That's the webinar for uh, Winter in the Head Start Garden, and hopefully you'll join us for Spring in the Head Start Garden. Um, have a, a wonderful day, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.